All right, so let's get started. Our today's class is on principal component analysis for machine learning. And this session is part of our free online course on introduction to machine learning. So let's see what we are gonna cover in our today's session. To make sure that everyone is on the same page, we'll go over a few things that we have seen in our previous classes. So we'll do a quick recap. And then we are gonna study something uh, very important in machine learning, which is called the concept of dimensionality reduction. And we are gonna use a technique which is called as principal component analysis or PCA to achieve this task. And obviously we don't want to just talk theory. We also want to implement PCA in Python. Towards the end, we'll go over some of the applications of PCA. And I hope to also organize you know, the next session extensively on where we'll you know, implement a face recognition or a digit recognition system. And we'll see how PCA can be applied to solve such problems. So here's what we have seen in our previous class. We have seen the differences between the supervised and unsupervised machine learning approaches. On the supervised machine learning task or you know, the problems, what we did was we were given a labeled data, data set. So given a set of you know, house prices, we were given some features and we were also told what the price of that house was. So we were given a labeled data set. Whereas in an unsupervised machine learning algorithm, you end up ha having cases, scenarios where the label data set is not available. And what you do is try to make sense of the data and try to find the hidden structures in the data itself. When you're doing supervised machine learning, you are, your main job is you're trying to predict something or you're trying to classify something. Whereas in unsupervised machine learning algorithms, we just said that it is important in some cases to find hidden structures or patterns in the data which might not be obvious. And in a general, at a very high level, we said that it is more of a, it's more formal problem than unsupervised machine learning because with, when you're doing unsupervised learning, your end goal sometimes is not known. You don't know things that you don't know, right? Let's say you are given this data set. This data set has two features over here, the height and the weight. And based on the height and the weight, we are trying to classify whether this person is either a male or they are a female. So we are given only three examples over here. Okay, so with looking at these three examples, even though it's a dummy example, now let's say this was given to us, and our job is to make a classifier which can learn to predict based on or to classify based on the height and the weight you want to say whether that person is a male or a female so let's say you plot it on a 2d graph like this the males seem to fall in this region of the graph and the females are somewhere over here so you end up creating a classifier which might come up with a solution like this one and we have already seen several techniques to create a classification boundary like this one. So now let's say I add another feature over here, which is called shoe size, right? And this shoe size, and you can imagine that this shoe size is somehow correlated to this height and weight, right? So people with you no know, higher, with the bigger height or you no know, who are taller, they might end up having a larger shoe size, but we still choose to use it. And we think that you no, know, adding more features to our data set might help. We don't know yet, okay? But we just added one more feature over here saying we'll use shoe size as well. So what's, what happens now? So our 2D graph now turns into a three-dimensional plot and we added those no, our readings again. Now I want you to observe and tell me some differences that you see between these points in a 2D plot like this one and a 3D plot like this one. We just added one more feature over there and I want you guys to tell me what are some of the differences that you see in versus having the same data set 
plotted in 2D and now we added one more dimension. So there is another dimension which is shoe size, which is going, you could imagine it is going outwards and you have these points over here now. So how are they different? How are these two plots different? Can you tell me what are some of the differences that you see besides the fact that there is a third dimension? Over here, if you observe, the entire, this entire points seem to be much closer together compared to this one. As soon as we added a third dimension over there, your points in the space are more spread out. Am I correct? Let's say what does our classifier do now? A classifier sees a pattern like this and what it might end up doing is create a decision boundary which might look something like this one. So it thinks that all the X's necessarily need in this space over here and all the zeros or all the females are somewhere in this region because it thinks that because it has seen only three examples, right? What it says is, I think all zeros must fall over here in this, this region. So what happens if you, someone gives us a new row to classify? So over here, someone gave us a new row to classify. And we said, we, they, were, they told us that the height was 5.5, weight was 50, and the shoe size is four. And because you now we had a four over here as well, and our classifier thinks that everything that in this region, which is close to four, must be a female, we predicted female. Is it necessary that in every instance, if the shoe size is around four, should you classify that person as a female? Or do you think it was just one instance when this has occurred and we shouldn't generalize that and we shouldn't learn too much from this? Exactly. There are other features that matter as well. But what is happening is because we have very less examples over here and more dimensions, our classifier is in technical terms, we are overfitting our classifier over here. Just by looking at few examples, because the number of dimensions are more, what we think is everything that looks like this must fall in this region. Adding another dimension is not necessarily a good idea. And conversely, what we could also say that if you are given a lot of dimensions, not necessarily all dimensions should be taken into account. And this is what we call sometimes as curse of dimensionality. What ends up happening is as you go on increase the number of dimension, one, your data points get more sparse in this space. They become increasingly away. What that does is one, it increases the size of your search. For your classifier, the time to train your classifier will be much greater because you will have to search through a bigger space than you would have to do with fewer dimensions. And two, what it also does is it overfits your model. What we do is it turns out that when you add more dimensions, you try to become overconfident. You think that because this point lies specifically in this region of the space, it must be that all such points are what constitute a female example. So that's what we are trying to get to today. What we are trying to see is how can we reduce this dimensions in a meaningful way such that we don't lose information that we have, but yet we are able to get better results down the line. So I have a task for you today and this will give you some insights on how we are going to go about reducing the dimensionality. I want you guys to draw this painting which you see in front of you. And I know that you won't excel at that, right? But try to do as good as you can, okay? Get your creative hats on. In next 30 seconds, 
draw the best version of Mona Lisa as you could on paper. Trust me, I'll tell you how that relates to dimensionality reduction. All right, so if you are someone like me who is not really artistic, you would end up with something like this. And if someone has a better picture than me, kudos to you. But if you drew even worse than this, then you should go and get some drawing classes, okay? But this is as worse as you, you, could, you could go. So what are we trying to do over here? So if let's say, you know, someone was more artistic, they could have also come up with a better version like this one, right? And by looking at this picture over here, will you guys agree with me that just by looking at this image as well, will a person be able to make out if this is Mona Lisa? A lot of people will be able to make out that this is a painting of Mona Lisa, right? So the point that I'm trying to make is over here, this is a much more higher dimensional view of this painting. Over here, the image might be, you no, know, this could be a 256 cross 256 or even more. This is 512 cross 512 pixels or something in that range. So how many dimensions do we have? 512 times 512. That's a lot of dimensions. That's a lot of features. Each pixel for our machine learning algorithm will be a feature. But what we are saying is to represent the same thing, to represent the same object, you don't need 512 times 512 pixels. We could also make up something like this one, which is definitely a which definitely needs less number of pixels, but still represents the same thing, the same underlying object there. So that should give you a sense of or insights into the next statement that I'm going to make. The statement that I want to make over here is given a training set or an example from your data set, there exists a lower dimensional subspace, which can still faithfully represent your object. Does everyone agree to me with that? Over here, we are seeing that Mona Lisa has been represented by 512 cross 512 pixels. But even if let's say I gave you a smaller picture of Mona Lisa, which was, I guess, 56 cross 56. Will you be able to make out from that image what that is? Yes, you could. And even if, let's say if the size was not less, if I drew an outline like this, you could still make out that this was a picture of Mona Lisa. So that's my statement. Given a data set, there exists a lower dimensional space from what you already have in most cases. Now, it, if, you have, if you already have very few features, let's say if you already have like five or six features, there might not be an efficient representation in a lower dimensional space. But in most cases, when you have a lot of features, most of the times what you will end up seeing is there is this inherent structure or there is this latent structure to the higher dimensional picture that you are seeing and that structure is what we are interested in today. We are interested in seeing, is there a structure or is there a pattern that might not be very obvious to our human eyes, but which can be extracted statistically? Can we extract that features or can we extract those features from our original data set? Okay, so that's what we are going to try to do today. We are going to try to get this inherent structure. And a lot of times what you're going to end up seeing is, for example, in this case, we saw that the shoe size was somehow related to height. It, right, so by our domain knowledge or by just, you know, from what we know, we know that these two features are related. 
and adding another dimension over here is just going to make your performance even worse if there is significant correlation between these two variables or these two features over here so when you end up having a lot of dimensions it is obvious that there is some inherent structure over here we saw that there was this structure which we could have extracted from the data which would result in a much lower dimensional representation of our original picture over there so let's move on from this let's see what we are more familiar with rather than dealing with mona lisa let's talk in terms of things that we are more familiar with over here i'm showing you a data set which was given to us where all these points mostly lie in this x y plane over here there might be some points over here which has a z component of 0.1 but mostly all these points have z component of 0 so they are lying on the surface over here so if i were to tell you to reduce the number of dimensions intuitively which two dimensions would you pick so rakshita thinks x and y ayon thinks that as well so yeah you both were right you would pick x and y and the reason you would do that is even if you get rid of this z axis you still end up representing your points more or less in the same fashion the only difference might be that if z was 0.1 over here now that 0.1 becomes 0 so that point might fall on the surface imagine that point which was slightly raised now goes back down so what ends up happening is you you were able to get reduce the dimension from 3 to 1 sorry from we were able to reduce our dimensions going from three dimensions we were able to go to two dimensions only now such that our data points are much more dense in this space over here we were just wasting this entire z space or this plane over here so now we are more dense over here our classification accuracy should increase now our takeaway from this slide should be we want to preserve the planes where we have most variations in our data our variations are along the y axis and the x axis we don't have a lot of variations around z axis so we want to preserve these two features or these two directions but life is not that simple a lot of times you will end up with a data like this now have a look at this data over here and can you tell me if i want to go from this two dimensions to one dimensions which axis will you drop x or will you drop y or something else so if i were you i would be afraid of dropping any one of those axes because there is significant amount of information in them right there is some variance along our y direction and there is some variance along x direction as well so in a lot of cases we can't just drop a dimension but is there a way where instead of dropping a dimension can we find another hidden dimension over here or another vector such that we still preserve a lot of our information but have a compact representation of our data so what if i told you if i draw a line like this over here let's say we have a vector z which is right in between over here and if i represent all these points on this z axis so what will happen is let's say if i zoom in to this portion so something like this would happen all the points will all the red dots who are who are in this shape like this they would fall to this z axis over here and instead of representing our data in x and y axis now what if i just represent it on the z axis will it be a more accurate representation of my data rather than just dropping out one of the x or y axes does everyone agree to me on that instead of just dropping 
x or dropping y what if we create a new dimension for us let's say z such that it passes it kind of passes right in middle and when we project all these points on this line or i shouldn't use that fancy word but a lot of times you're going to hear that word projection projection is nothing but let's say if you have this point over here you are projecting this point on this z axis you are assuming what happens if it falls over here so what what's the new point that will get formed so that's the projection of this point on this line and this axis that we are trying to come up with or this vector z is in this case what you see is also the first principal component of this data set and that's why we are uh, the name of our class today was analyzing those principal components given a data set how do you find these vectors which preserve most of your information but still you go from two dimensions over here to over here we are going from two dimensions to just one dimension z such that most of the information in our data set is still preserved does that make sense so intuitively what we are trying to do is we are trying to find a direction such that these points don't move a lot we want these points to still stay same in this xy plane even if we project those things on the z vector and what if i told you to minimize the movement of points that is the loss of information is equal to finding a line such that when the points are projected they are as separate as as possible so when you project these points this line should be such that when you project these points these brown points need to be as far apart as possible try to imagine that and if you are not able to imagine it let me show you now now do you see when i'm moving this line at this point this projection this black line is a terrible one because these points have to move a lot now this is okay but now these points these red points are getting far away and at this point where it was cutting this pink line over here they were farthest with each other so what we are saying is if we want these blue points and red points to be as close as possible these red points need to be as far apart on this line as possible does everyone agree to me on that read this statement that i'm making over here and this visualization on the left and tell me if that makes sense to you i'm going to wait over here for a few seconds let you guys grasp this information that i'm giving that if you want these points to move as little as possible so if you want these this blue point to be as close as this red point as possible that is nothing but is equal to saying that finding a line such that these points are as far apart on the black line these red points need to be as far apart on the black line as much we, as we can we are trying to find a line which will have maximum variance when these points will be projected okay so let's try to formalize it a little so let's say again i have this plane over here now we have already told that there exists a direction such that if we use that direction we want these points to have maximum variance so over here just by looking at the graph we can say that this line over here something which is going from the origin over here so this line or this vector will have will be the line which will have maximum variance so the maximum variation in this data set just by looking at it will be around this line we have a quantity for us called as covariance of a matrix so covariance in this data set is given by you just take each x size and multiply that with the transpose of xi and you average it out 
So that will give you the covariance if the mean is zero and we have the mean as zero over here. All these points, we are assuming that they are centered around origin. So we are, we know that the covariance of this data set over here is given by each point multiplied by, you now you, you take all Xi's and you multiply by a transpose of Xi. That will give you the covariance. And let me also tell you that covariance in this, if you do this math over here for this data set, let's say this covariance is you no know, a matrix that you get. Now I want to show you instead of deriving PCA, I want to show you what happens an interesting observation that we have. So let's say if I multiply, take any random vector over here. So I took a vector minus one comma one. And what happens if I multiply this with the covariance matrix? I get something like 1.3 minus 0.2, okay? So if you multiply this covariance matrix with any random vector, so let's say I took minus one comma one, that will give me minus 1.3 minus one two. So this minus 0 0.3, 0 0.2, if you plot it on the graph, it will be somewhere over here. So minus on X axis and minus negative on the Y axis as well. So it will be in this quadrant over here. So let me just put it over there. So we got this new vector. What happens if you multiply it again? what you get is minus 2.74 minus 0.1. So again, we are in the same direction. We are in the same quadrant over here, but our vector, which was initially it was minus 0.13 or minus 1.3. Now it is minus two. So our vector is getting bigger, but it is rotating less. So now we are somewhere over here in the blue. And if you multiply it once more, what you will end up seeing is this vector is getting rotated in a direction of the maximum variance. Eventually, even if you keep on multiplying, as you see, it is we are converging to something over here. Initially, our rotation was quite large, but ultimately what happened is we kept on decreasing the rotation, but our length of vectors keep kept on increasing. So I'm trying to show you an interesting observation about the covariance matrix. And why are we dealing with covariance matrix? Because we are interested in maximizing the variance. And what we are seeing over here is, if you are given a covariance matrix, you multiply that with any random vector. In this case, we are taking minus one comma one. That vector will get rotated by a certain degree and eventually it will stop rotating a lot more. It will converge to a point which has the maximum variance. And in this case, we converge to this orange vector over here. And this problem seems to be familiar to you, right? If you have taken mathematics in your engineering classes or no, if you have taken advanced courses with mat matrices, has anyone seen something like this before? Yep, Rakshita got it right, Egan vectors, right? So what we are essentially saying is coming up with this is nothing but doing an Egan decomposition of this covariance matrix C. It happens to be that these lambdas are also Egan values of this covariance matrix and the vector V itself are the Egan vectors. Now let me give you some properties about these Egan vectors. The vector V times V transpose is an identity matrix. We don't want any correlations or these vectors, the first vector and the second vector are gonna be orthogonal to each other, okay? So, we have already seen that, why do we need that, right? Because over here we said that if the shoe size was dependent on height, we want to get rid of this shoe size. So that's what intuitively PCA is trying to do as well. It is trying to find directions which are orthogonal to each other. So over here, VI times P transpose is identity matrix and VI times VJ is zero. There is no correlation between 
uh, the two components of that vector okay so here are the steps to perform the pca what we will do is first center all our xi's around origin so that our math becomes much easier down the ground so we'll center all our data points around origin so we need to scale all our data points such that their mean is zero second step to do pca as we saw we'll calculate the covariance matrix and this covariance matrix is nothing but you take xi and you multiply it by the transpose of xi and you average it for all by divided by the number of points that you have that will give you the covariance matrix and third we already saw was given this covariance matrix we want to calculate the eigen vectors and the eigen values of c so that the eigen vectors will give us the direction where we have the maximum variance what we do is we take all these eigen vectors and arrange them in a matrix like this one and we arrange them with increasing order of their eigen values so if lambda 1 was the eigen value corresponding to v1 we'll have this as first then v2 v3 and so on so we create this matrix v such that this eigen vectors are in ascending order or descending order of their corresponding eigen values then what we will do is the whole point of this exercise was to reduce dimensions right over here this will be an m by m matrix where if m if we have m dimensions there will be an m square matrix which is too high we don't want that we don't want those many dimensions what we could do is actually take just a subset of all the vectors that we have and the reason why we could do this is this eigen values which these vectors correspond to they tell us they give us a sense of how much variation that eigen vector captures so over here the amount of variation that your reduced subset will retain will be given by so let's say we are just taking two vectors over here corresponding to lambda 1 and lambda 2 the amount of variations or the amount of variations that we are retaining is given by lambda 1 plus lambda 2 divided by all the lambdas okay so this will be this will give us amount of variation that we are retaining in this data so if you plot a chart it would be something like this one over here you have k number of components you have principal component 1 2 3 and so on and you will see a graph like this so the percentage of variation that i'm capturing in first few eigen values will be lot higher after a point it just you now we are just getting incrementally better increase in the variance initially first few components it will increase exponentially so that's the reason i can just take two components and still get a better or a close enough representation of my data the next thing that we want to do is we want to project this input data that we have remember the whole point was to get a compressed representation of our data points right so the whole point was to project our data set on to something else so that we can get a compressed representation so what we will do is we'll create this new vector x transformed which is also the compressed representation of x such that we take this vr this reduced sub uh, vector subspace that we got over here so this is the vr and we just transpose it and you now apply to x so this is nothing but projection of this points on to vector vr okay so we got this x transformed or this is the pca representation in pca subspace or in the pca world we are saying that this xi in pca form is nothing but this vr matrix that we got from here transpose it and multiply that with each x okay simple 
let's say if you have to recover this information let's say if you have to go back from x transform to x again how do you how would you do that if you take multiply both sides of this equation over here with vr what will what you will end up seeing is this vr times vr transpose is a unit matrix because that's a property of our eigen vector because this is one this will be equal to x itself right so this part will become one we still have x so what we are saying is even with this transform space if you multiply the transformed version of your vector with vr itself you will end up having the original x that is we can recover x this slide is just another version another way to represent this graph over here right so sometimes you see people you know selecting m or how many principal components to keep by looking at this chart which is the cumulative sum of all the variation which is retained and over here you could also or another way to put it is you know by looking at this chart over here so with each for the first principal component you will have maximum variation which is getting captured from second you will capture a little less in the third principal component you will have even less and after a point you know you will stop reducing so this is very similar to the the elbow chart that we saw for knn right at this point we say okay it doesn't help anymore after this point we are not capturing enough variation in our data so we can in this case we can select principal components four number of principal components or we can just keep top three components over here so let's go ahead and implement pca what we have in this data set are four features of this flower so what species of this flower it is so is it the setosa or the other the rest three of these okay so these are the features and these are the labels this is the data set that we are going to work on today we are going to try to see instead of representing in this four feature space is there a better representation that we can get in pca subspace so what we are going to do is as we do usually we are going to load our data set using pandas library so go ahead and do that so what we are going to say is data frame is equal to pd dot read underscore csv and guys we have done this several times in our previous classes so i'm just going ahead with this so i'm going to say iris dot csv now what we need to do is let's look at the data frame and let's see what do we have over here so let's say print data frame so that we just print out the first few rows over there okay so we printed the first few rows over here what we see is these are our columns in our data frame we have an id we have sepal length in centimeters the width the petal length and the petal width and this is the species which is the eventual classification label if you do a classification if this is for a classification this is what you would use for your labels right so let's go ahead and take the features let's separate out our features so what we need to do is let's just say let's take labels over here first so i'm going to say labels is equal to now this can be after this so we need to say labels is equal to data frame of species right so i'm going to say species over here and then i'm going to say x i'm going to make all my take all my features together so from data frame i want all my features i just want the features so what i could do is just drop the id and the species over here right so x is equal to data frame of need to drop we could say id and get rid of the species right so this will give us all our features and let's do it on the column so we need to say axis as one right everyone with me until here so do this and let me know if you have reached to this point
just print out your data frame, inspect what's there inside. And then what we did is just separated out the labels and our features. So labels were this last column over here and we are taking X, which is our feature vector X, which is nothing but this entire data frame minus ID and the species. Okay. What was the first step of our PC algorithm? And I can go back over here and show you the slides as well. Right. We need to center all our data around origin, right? And right now we are not sure if that is true. So what we could do is use a SkyKit learn function, a method from SkyKit learn, which is going to help us get everything centered around origin. And to give you a hint, we I'm already importing it somewhere and I'm highlighting that to help you. Can you use this standard scalar? method from skykit learn dot preprocessing so that everything is centered around origin go ahead and try to do that so what we need to do is we'll say x standardize is equal to we'll create an object of this standard scalar and then use fit transform right And we'll fit transform X on this. So this will give us X standard, which is what we have done is taken the X and centered it around origin. Okay. Next, what we will do is let's do this. Let's initialize our PCA. So what we'll do is let's call our PCA method from SkyKit learn. So we're going to say PCA is equal to PCA and we'll use four components over here. We'll use four vectors. So we are saying there are four dimensions. We are not reducing any dimensions. Okay. So let's see if we do four components. So we are not doing anything as such. Uh, now we are just doing a useless PCA because we had four features and we are saying that create a PCA with four features as well. So what we are doing is just trying to see how many of those four components are useful. Let's let's transform this input vector. So we know that X transform is equal to now which line of code will you use over here again we'll use fit transform again right so it's similar to what we did before so we're going to say pca dot fit transform and then let's give x standardized right so now this x transform will have the pca version or no in x transform will be in this pca subspace okay now i want to find out given this transformation that we have done, can you go and look up the PCA documentation on SkyKid learn and find out what attribute will give us a sense of how much variance is contained in each of these components. So go and look up the documentation of PCA on SkyKid learn. And what we see over here is, so this is how we initialize it using the end components. And let us check for some of the attributes. So these are the attributes components. We already know we are using four. And then there is explained variance. So explained variance gives us the amount of variance explained by each of the selected components, right? That's what we are interested in. So let's copy this attribute name and let's print it out. So let's print out PCA dot this guy, which was PCA dot explain underscore variance underscore. I don't know why they gave this naming convention, but seems like it works for them. So what you see is in the first two principal components itself, we can capture the maximum variance. And again, so this explain variance, these are not in terms of percentages okay so what we could get is instead of saying just explained variance what we could also say is explained variance ratio that might give you a better sense because you might be getting confused so as you see now this makes sense right 0 
uh, so we had in the first principal component we are getting 72 percent in the second principal component we are capturing 23 percent of the variance and so on right so can someone tell me just by looking at these numbers how many principal components should we retain so over here we are saying n equals to four but that doesn't make sense we already have four features but we would rather go with just those four features the whole point of this exercise was to reduce the number of components or number of features so looking at these numbers how many principal components do you think we should retain yeah suchit and rakshita both got two first two principal components are capturing all our variants right 95 percent of our variants if you add 72 and this 23 95 percent of our variance is explained in the first two principal components so let's just use two components over here that will help us you know downstream when we do a classification or if you want to visualize data it will be much easier because with two principal components we are still explaining 95 percent of the variance in our original data set okay so that's good next what we could do is print this thing out so that it's more clear print x transform over here so what we are saying is we have an list like these a list or an array like this one and the first principal component is actually this first column over here right so this vertical column that's what i want to extract and the second vertical column over here i mean columns are always vertical but this second column over here that's what i'm trying to extract okay and the way what we could and the way we could do that is you could say pca1 is i'm going to do an inverse zip on this one and we could say inverse zip of x transform and get the zeroth element of that list okay and then do a pca2 is equal to again the same thing i'm just getting the first column of this list of list and the second column of this list of lists okay now let me also create a colors dictionary so that before when we try to visualize the data it was not clear which label it was right so just for the sake of visualization and creating this colors dictionary and what i'm going to do is use the names of our labels so if you go up and look over these guys the species for all the data sets we have three species over there so i'm just going to add the name of those three species for the three colors okay so i added three colors for my three labels okay and now let's visualize it so let's go from for a label for each label in labels so i want to go for all my i want to plot all my points and my labels has all the points as well so i'm going to say for label in labels i'm going to say plot dot scatter i want to plot each point i want to plot the pca1 right and i'm going to do pca2 on just pca1 now this point should be the ith element so let's just say i is equal to 0 and let's i is equal to over here pca1 of i pca2 of i and there are uh, so many ways to iterate over a list i'm just doing the one which is most naive and most simplest for someone to understand okay color is equal to color dict of this label right so what we are going to say is which color to use come over here look for this label and get green over here right so color will be green if our label is iris setosa right so that's what i'm just doing just plotting the points with different colors so that i can see them on my 
plot over there. Okay, I'm just going to do a plot dot show over here. So let's see if this works. A much better way to represent our data as we see over here is using the principal components, right? Because if in the PCA space, this green color over here, this green is for the species one over here, right? So the first species, which is Iris setosa over here, is clearly getting separated out. In the original space, you now if you try to plot it, it won't be very obvious on where the species are. But over here in the PCA space, you could see that first species is definitely getting separate out. In the second species as well, there is some, if you apply a nonlinear classification method over here, you might be able to get pretty good results over here as well. Right? So that's what we did. We used PCA to get a better sense of our data. We were able to reduce the dimensions from four to two because we said that, you know what? 95% of our variation is still contained in first two principal components. 